Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking on a Thursday. Thanks for joining on Thursday. I'm sorry I wasn't able to make yesterday's episode. It was just too much of a thing with too much of a, speaking of too much of a thing, um, with getting ready for that design like the Great American Quilt uh, that we started last night. It was super fun. If you were on, I had a ton of fun and I'm looking forward to Sunday night rerunning that um, particular class. It is really, really interesting to see what the crossover can be between quilting, which I think most of us do also, and rug making. Um, and it got me into looking at my quilting books again, which is where it brought me this morning for this episode. I'm gonna do a slightly shorter episode than usual because I forgot it was a half day today and I've got to pick Teddy up. So I'm gonna end abruptly at about quarter of so I can be at his school in time. And knowing that I have customized this episode so I can be very careful. I will say a good morning to my buddies, Linda, Heidi. Good morning, Suze, good morning, Tara. I like to see all the sun shining and the flowers blossoming. That's how we feel, that's how it is. I put this link up so late, I apologize for that. It was not a good sleeping night last night, I'll tell you, at four, wide awake at four, and I am dragging now. Um, need to move a little bit faster and get my brain ignited, but uh, you're, all, you're all finding it. Good, Doreen, good to see you. Sally, great to see you. I love the picture you posted of hooking against the chain link fence. Crystal, great to see you. Oh, good. I'm going to keep an eye on the link, but I'm going to keep going because I know it's going to be a time problem at some point during this episode. So while I was working on putting together the Design Like the Great American Quilt um, class, as you can imagine, it was hard um, volume-wise sifting through all that information because over the years there have been so many types of quilts. They can all be adapted for the most part. All of them be adapted style-wise to rug making. And I realized as I got going with the research part of it that it was an overwhelming task. It was not a one class um, job. So I tailored it square peg circle hole into the one class and just pinned down the corners of the blanket. So I felt like I had covered the most important things, but it really brought me back into the rabbit's warren of quilt books, design, um, and it was that's one of the reasons I was having trouble sleeping. My brain was not shutting off at all last night. Joyce, great to see you. Dave, great to see you. Um, so this is where I'm at right now. I started thinking about um, quilts that have crossed over famously to rug making. And the one I was thinking about was one that I could not find an image of. If you can find an image, please let me know if you're able to post it to our Facebook group, which is Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club, it's the Joan Moshimer Schoolhouse Quilt. Oh, I'm sorry, Hook Truck. Do you know the one I mean? If you if you visit Door uh, Mill in person, right in Newport, New Hampshire, then you might recognize it because it's in the entryway. It's one of Joan Moshimer's most famous pieces, right? And it's based obviously on a quilt design, the schoolhouse design, which is based on the house design. Uh, but I could not, I took a picture of it with my phone last time I was there. I just could not find it. I had to give up. But um, I know that you can appreciate uh, the image because you must have it in your head what this multiple schoolhouses look like, right? And that rug was so famously done by her and so popular when it came out. Chrissy, good to see you. Cat's Gallery, great to see you. So when I was thinking about that, I started thinking about the, the house in quilting and rug making, right? Because it's already crossed over. And um, Barbara, great to see you. So that brought me to Crazy Rabbit Hole with the quilt books looking at schoolhouse quilts. Now I did include this, I did not include this in the class that schoolhouses for, um, you know, designing like the Great American Quilt because I, did, I knew I was gonna do it on coffee time. So don't feel like if you're signing, signed up for the class for a Sunday that you're gonna get double information. I, there's many things I didn't cover because I wanted to cover them here instead. So I started thinking about the schoolhouse and how it changed over into being a house, house quilt. And I started thinking from there about how the house quilt, the design block of a house slash schoolhouse slash church slash however you adopt it, how it has crossed over hugely into rug making. And it brought me to thinking about rugs we've looked at in the past many times by, for example, Claire Murray, 
those village green style rugs, right? Picture the village green style where you have a big open center where there's like a green block or sometimes there's water, like it's the coastline. And right around the perimeter are all of these buildings. And we've talked about in the past, how, what, what a nice idea, what a fun idea, Pup just came to visit. It is to put houses and buildings from your town around the village green, right? Easily done. Honey, don't you cry. Don't you cry. There, oh, she went away. I was gonna, she's so cute. She is so cute. She's thinking she can get some snackies if she cries, and it usually works. So I'm going to share a screen. April, good to see you. Beverly, good to see you. It's just a different day today. I was so worried I wasn't going to be ready for the class in time last night. I was working on the class for about three days, which is really too much because it's a two-hour class. Um, but again, I was synthesizing, and it was it was it was troubling. It was hard getting it the way I wanted it. It's there, but it was a lot. Um, so let me share some stuff with you that I found yesterday from the quilt world that crosses over to this conversation of home and houses. I found this book. I should really show you, wait a minute, hold on. I should really show you, you know, let me show you the other, no, let's do this. I'm going to show you this book. Um, I was going to show you this one first. These are the two I'm working with today, right? Because they're both, they both feature houses. This one has birdhouses on the cover. So we're going to look at some of the straight up house motifs in that too. Sue, good to see you. But this book, and I'm, we're going to look at pictures together on the slideshow, has become, it, and it always was, but I kind of forgot, moving more toward rug making and forgetting about my quilt books. One of my favorite books of all times. I wonder if you know this artist, Freddie Moran. Freddie is a female, like I think probably short for Frederica. Um, absolutely brilliant and inspiring book for any medium. So let's look at some versions of Freddie's house because this really is the house from the Joan Moshimer quilt, right? Rug, same thing, who cares, right? Say it's the same image, but like nine of them, 16 of them, huge multiples of them, each done in different colors. And that's what Joan Moshimer's looks like too. Um, so let's come and look at some of these because in terms of using a line drawing like this to make a composition for a rug, this is a no brainer. This is like a done deal. Um, just checking in with the, Sally says, I want to patchwork uh, small rug squares to make a room size rug, but will it work? You wanna patch, so you wanna put, Sally, you wanna put um, small pieces together, like small tile size, um, hooked rug pieces sewn together to make a larger rug? I'll just qualify that and then I'll come back over. So this is the cover of the book. Um, Freddie's house that I just showed you. I just want to be clear that this is what it looks like because it is so good. I'm going to show you bits and pieces of it now and some of the sort of wisdom that's in this book because her book is really about managing her house, buying a house, decorating it to be to her taste, and her taste is very bold and colorful. She really wants her personality to come through in the decoration of the house, and that's what brings us to the making of this book. It's This is Freddie. It's in part a memoir, it's in part an instructional, inspirational book, but for me the best thing about the book are the pictures and the quotes from her that are super enabling about using bold colors, striking out on your own no matter what kinds of comments you get from your neighbors. Uh, she really has created a sort of paradise house. Oh Sue, I'm excited that you're there. We, we do this at least three times a week. That reminds me, we're going to have to think of something for a Friday. I haven't even started that yet. Yes, hook and assemble them. Okay, so that, you know, let me come back for a minute. I have to say, Sally, I have not done that. I have not pieced. I've pieced small pieces that are not meant for the floor. So if anybody has any feedback to chime in there, um, my natural, as a as a person with sewing, a sewing degree, right? This is, I'm not thinking as a rug maker here. I'm thinking more practically about the the process of sewing them together. That part's easy. But does anybody have more information who's done this pieced um, hooked rug pieces for a larger floor piece, not the wall? Uh, because I'm just worrying and thinking about pull and practicality. Of course, there are ways that you could reinforce it with bias bindings and the twill tape and stuff like that. Let me think on it too, but in the meantime, let's see if anybody has done this who's in the thread that can chime in and say, yes, it works great. It's gonna be a yes. We just have to figure out how to make that piece as stable 
and as practical as possible underfoot. Because a wall piece is fine. It's going to hang there and it's going to live. But a floor piece needs to live too and it needs a bit more um, stability. And having broken it up into pieces to begin with and starting there has potential to create um, tension, pull in places where it's stitched together. So I'm curious to see what people are going to say. And if nobody comments on it, Sally, I'll think about it. I'll do some research and I'll get back to you myself on it. So this is Freddie on her stairs. And you know what? Let me look at the book while we do this at the same time because she had some really, I think, beautiful and inspiring quotes. Crystal says, I think it would be difficult to sew tightly enough. I'm going to keep an eye on that too. When I opened this book, I was immediately... Um, excited I'm gonna come back to you for a minute by the amount of text that's in here because it does read a lot like a memoir she's such a positive person she's such an inspiring person and when I say enabling wait till you see her collection of materials it is what we all need in our lives to make us feel justified in all of the stuff that we buy and, and have so this is how she starts the book as an introduction she says quilting is my passion I feel everyone needs a passion in their life I think having a passion keeps us active, alive, and interesting, and interested in other people and places. Quilting has led me to meet a fabulous group of people and to travel the world to wonderful parts. Quilting keeps our minds creative. I make quilts, and we can substitute for the word rugs too, or anything that you like to do the best. Uh, I make quilts because I have to. I honor my creator through my quilts. I make quilts because I like to. If others like them, all the better. But I would make quilts even if I had to stack them hidden in a closet. Right. So that's what passion really is, isn't it? Um, feeling like you just have to. It's how you express yourself. For whatever reason you like to do creative things, it doesn't matter if it's the same reason as the person sitting next to you, right? And it doesn't matter if there's room to display all of them. What matters is the process because the process is what's serving you, isn't it? It's filling a gap. It's, it's satisfying something in your life that needs to be there. Uh, it could be 100% creative. Uh, it could be a soul thing. It could be a challenge thing. It could be a business thing. Whatever it is, right? It doesn't really matter. It just matters that you follow. And then she says, in, as she introduces her home and the picture of her up on the stairs, let me put that one back up. She says, welcome to my home. I believe a quilter's home is a haven and I want to show you what I've done with mine. I hope to show you how quilts and houses have a symbiotic relationship. One complements the other. One relies on the other. And she put a star here. When you walk into my home, I want you to feel as though you're walking into one of my quilts. Now that is a really interesting idea because that it, it means everything is aligned, doesn't it? Symbiotic is a perfect word for this. Um, let me show you a couple of the other rooms that she's got right here at the beginning. I'm not going to show you the whole book because it's available, it's inexpensive, it's all over the place on Etsy, Amazon, all of these. You see why she loves this property because she's obviously got an amazing indoor, outdoor, and outdoor situation going here because she's got all of her what look like Majolica plates hanging up in a screened in area. And there seems to be quite a few trees. There was one in the last photo too inside the house. Um, <laughs> which is interesting. You, you rarely see that, right? You rarely see that. She really goes for, in her own color palette, she knows what she likes. She likes the bold colors. She makes no secret of saying, uh, um, oh, she doesn't say it here. Yep, yeah, no, she does. I began decorating and styling my house by selecting bold, uncompromising colors. When I selected a color, I didn't use a muted color. There would never be a case of someone not knowing or identifying the color because I use the pure hue. This is a color palette choice, right? So this is her style. It super appeals to me. It's so bohemian. It's so cool looking. She talks about having bought this house. You see how she painted sort of checkerboard on the stairs? I feel like she hasn't entered the rug world at this point because I feel like if she had, we'd see quite a lot of rugs here too. This is a centerfold. 
Uh, you can see my hand in there, but I had to show you the whole picture. She really is using bold colors. Now for me, you know, for my personal preference is like the, the dusty rose, the teal, those 1980s colors I grew up with. For you, you know what your colors are too, right? So the thing is not to do bold colors where it wouldn't fit your life. It is to do your colors in your life. And that's exactly what she's done here too with all of this mismatch, ma mismatching uh, shins, like overstuffed furniture, more majolica above the mantle. I mean, it's just crazyville inside this house. I would love to do like a house swap in a house like this and to be able to, at liberty with nobody watching, check out all of her stuff. Beautiful dummy board here of a bunny, right? So you can see how in this house, she really, um, she goes full blast with her color, but she decorates accordingly too. She puts her collections of collections all over the place. And she said, you know, when she bought this house, I'm paraphrasing here from memory, she said when she bought it, it's like this kind of rambling, um, all redwood, so all natural wood on the inside house. And she loved the outdoor element to it. Hey, Karen. Um, and she said, you know, I just wondered, panicking, will I be able to convert this house into something that I really like color-wise that represents her life and the way that she likes to live color-wise? And she did figure out how to do that by adding all of these colors, right? So it's not for everybody. It's about, this book is about personalizing your house in the same way that you create, in her case, a house quilt. She's building it piece by piece the same way. She's starting with foundation colors, her favorite colors, and then she's building layer upon layer upon layer. And a quilt is a great analogy for this. She keeps adding like an applique, many layers until she gets the colors right, until she gets the collections all represented, until it really is in harmony, right? And by harmony, I mean it's a jumble fest because that's her style. Each hook a house. We could each hook a house, Sally. You know, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Um, ooh, oh, I like that. All right, um, I'm coming back to that. Don't think I'm gonna forget. And Joy said, Alex Anderson, host of The Quilt Show, has a YouTube tour of her house and a show about her. Interesting. So let's check that out, too. I'm going to check that out this afternoon after I pick up the kids from school. Uh, Alex Anderson, host of The Quilt Show, has a, tour, a YouTube tour of her house. I would be real interested in seeing that. That's great info. Thank you so much. All this crossover is going to serve us really well because we're going to get inspiration. Um, upside down, sideways, right side, flip side, back side, everything. I'm just moving forward to look at some other. I don't want to show you every picture um, because if you're interested in the book, you should have the book. It is one of these bedside books that um, is so lush and dense that every time you pick it up, you see something different. So here's Freddie in her hall with her studio behind her, one of her quilts, some of her books. Um, and, you know, she says, and again, I'm paraphrasing in this book, she always struggles with getting feedback from people, whether she's working on decorating a new part of her house or whether she's working on a quilt because she said and I'm sure a lot of you have experienced the same aggravating dynamic she said people are sometimes giving feedback when you wish that they would put a lip zipper on it instead so this can happen and that is the risk that you run when you show someone anything including your house um, but you know it depends to each of us in different measures how important it is to get feedback so she says, for example, while she was decorating her house, just like as she's working on her quilts, she has to constantly ignore remarks, um, uninvited remarks, of critic-turned-decorator type people. And she said, it was amazing how many felt it was their duty to point out that one room was red and another room was aqua. So, and she said, same thing with her quilts. You show somebody a work in progress, they might say something that makes your heart soar, right? Or they might make something that make, kills your confidence, brings you down like a baseball bat to the knees, and you don't even want to do it anymore. So you have to protect yourself from that. Know how you are. Know how you deal with feedback. When you want to strike out on a limb and do something so bold, but more importantly, so you, and you're flying your flag and putting that out there, and you get criticism back in return, you have to be sure that if you put it out there that you can handle what people might say because people are dirty little skunks and we already know that in our group we've been very fortunate that everybody is so kind 
and so encouraging to each other. But you step outside into the bigger world or the Facebook world, uh, and you get baseball bat to the knees more often than not, right? So just a thought. I get that too, and sometimes I just don't finish a project because I feel so um, crushed, you know? And then maybe you return to it with a who cares kind of an attitude a year later or something. But uh, we, all, we all know what our, what our threshold is. This is her husband's study. So as you can imagine, her husband, Neil, also likes color. And you can see one of her really stunning quilts in the background. Painted furniture. This is another biggie for her. There's another folded up quilt. That big fish jug with the sunflowers. Uh, everything on the red wall. I mean, it's really, really bold. And as she put together the layers of his study, obviously he liked it and allowed it, right? It actually turned into both of their favorite rooms, like mutually favorite room of the entire house, even over the studio. So they spend a lot of time together in here while he's working. She's in there, he's in there. They both just enjoy the atmosphere. So it worked out and it can work out that way. His walls are painted, as one of her neighbors noted, bright red. And she said, good morning, Lorraine. She said, and I think this is a very important takeaway point, and this is something that we have touched on in Coffee Time and Cocktail Time episodes. This is a quote. She says, just an observation. I consider red a neutral. Now, we talked about this when we did that 1980s uh, themed episode, looking at that uh, decorating book. And at that point, I said, make sure that you make your own color wheel at some point when you're feeling it. And you put your colors on that color wheel in place of the ones that are there. If you are a straight up true color person, then you stick with it the way it is. But if you are a person who your pink is dusty rose and your blue is peacock teal, then you need to, in your mind, accept that and put together your own color wheel with your neutrals. Because those neutrals, we touched on it again in the episode about Margaret Arage, uh, Mill River Rugs in Massachusetts. Remember all of the colors that she would use in the background. She used a special coral that was very her, a special sort of olive and sage green that was very her in almost every rug. And they became her signature colors. They became so widely used throughout her rug library that they became her neutrals. So yes, red is not a neutral. Yes, it's a double negative. It's not a neutral, but in your color palette, which will be so satisfying and fun for you to evolve, you choose what your neutrals are, and then you figure out the color wheel around them, right? So you embrace those things. Um, hey, Lynn, good to see you. I was late in posting it. It was, it was definitely a my bad this morning. I was super late in posting it. Let me pop up some more of these little things and see if I can pull out some more gems. This book is just great. I really had a rough night, so I'm not as prepared as I like to be. Um, this is her studio. I mean, there's many shots of her studio. She's got yellow in there. She's got a lot of house quilts up in her studio. Um, lot, lots going on, obviously. This is, whether you are a rugger or a quilter, this is obviously a heaven on earth situation. Look at the fish knobs and everything, right? And there's a cute picture of her in her, in her work area. This is just a corner, right? This is a, this is like a, the closet within the closet. This is the Russian nesting doll of the closet with just a couple of colors behind her. And she's deciding what fabrics to use. And there's a whole, what colors, right? There's a whole section of this book that is devoted to that. And again, it's gonna be like, you need a Rosetta Stone when, when you read someone else's book about color, particularly if your colors are not bold. I love bold colors, so I read it as is. But it's like when you go to a church that's not yours and you need to substitute some of the words in your head so that you're a bit more comfortable, a bit more inspired. It's the same thing with these books when someone's talking about a specific color palette. You make substitutions in your head because the universal truths are, are stable, but sometimes the colors or the way that we're describing the color wheel or uh, relating to it is different. Those are moving targets and those are personal choices. But she talks about how anybody who is a quilt maker, and I'm gonna say, and also a rug maker, has a huge um, collection of fabric, right? And that is very true for us too. And she says something that I think is a really important point. This is gonna be a weird form of enabling now. She's saying she collects fabric because she loves it. And she doesn't know when she will use that fabric, but she loves it. 
So when she goes out to a store and she sees something that she loves, she buys it, right? If she can, right? We're not being ridiculous. Not everybody can have everything that they want. But if she's able to buy it, she buys it and she keeps it. And that goes into her fabric, her fabric store. And when it comes time to make a new piece, she goes through her colors, like in that picture we were just looking at, and she says, thank you, Tara, remember to give thumbs up. And she says to herself, the materials that I have to choose from for this project are already inside this house, right? So it is a dangerous thing. We all work differently. We all shop differently. We all have different means, right? When I feel this way too, that this is a um, good benchmark rule. If I were to go to Door Mill every time I started a new project, my bank account would be in the red constantly because I would be there buying yardage. I would be matching colors as I went, maybe not in the right mindset. That might, I'm just going to put it out there. For me, that's not the right way to work. I agree with what Freddie is saying that if you just pick up things, whether they're from Goodwill, thrifty, recycled things, sweaters, coats, wool, cotton, whatever, and you have that in your house already, then when it comes time for a new project, you shop in your house because your favorite, f favorite fabrics are there. Hey, if you go to a yard sale next weekend and there's a bunch of old coats and you bring those in, they'll be there for the next project. But if you shop new every time you start a new project, number one, you're going to build up a hoard that's like James and the Giant Peach going to kill you. It's going to be so gigantic. And secondly, you're going to spend way too much money. If you know that you love the stuff that you already have, then just start there. Sometimes you need to buy one or two fill things, right? But not the whole project. I think that's really solid advice uh, for any craft. So let's come back over here. I'm keeping my eye on the time with this half day business. For those of you who are tuning in late, I didn't realize the kids had a half day today, so I'm gonna shoot out uh, right before quarter of so that Teddy's not the only boob who's standing out on the curb waiting for his mom to come. All right, let's see, what have we got here? Oh, see, this is just her black and white stash. So remember how she just said red for her is a neutral? It definitely, it definitely is. We've seen how she uses the color red, but she's also saying that over time, she realizes that the use of black and white in every project has become her signature. Now, isn't that an awesome thing when you realize that you are um, repeating something, right? She loves the black and white and they make a great break, a great breath in between all of the other bold colors that she loves. Isn't it great when you figure out that you have a signature and if you remember the segment that we did on what's going on here if you remember the segment that we did ages ago on the book by mary Jo kimball and her husband carl with a k um about the tavern signs hooking the tavern signs and remember mary Jo's symbol was the little like the little what looked like the rising sun like the ben franklin rising sun with the funny nose and the eyes peeking out, tiny, tiny, in all of her pieces. That was her signature. Just like for Magdalena, some, her sometime signature was the bird with the little cherry in its mouth. Well, um, Freddie's signature is using black and white with all these bold colors. Now, of course, other people can do the same thing. It's not exactly a signature, but it's a signature look. And isn't it fun, again, just like with Margaret Arage of Mill River Rugs, um, to realize at a certain point, to realize and accept that you are gravitating toward the same colors and to think to yourself, instead of constantly challenging myself to use colors that I don't like, I like using these colors. I like using Dusty Rose in every piece. Maybe that's my signature, right? It's a different way to own it. Some people like to be challenged and pushed out of their comfort zone. Other people like to sit right in it because it's nice and warm, right? So it's up to you how you work, but I love the idea of accepting uh, oneself and saying, you know what, this is something I do every time. Instead of fighting against it and trying to constantly be new, which can be exhausting, I'm going to accept it and say, this is my signature. So these are what her, her house quilts look like. This one is called Parade of Homes. Just extraordinary, right? I mean, it's just color. Color-wise, the amount of play. Now, all of these repeat type designs have a pop art quality to them, right? Andy Warhol pop art repeat uh, pattern. When you do a repeat motif like this, 
you can always choose, do I want the exact same thing in every, I'm going to say block, even though it's a quilting term, in every block. Or, which, which creates a lot of stability and a very strong graphic design, right? Almost like a pattern, like a wallpaper fabric pattern. Or, and I'm, one is not better than the other here, I'm just saying both. Or, do I want each cell or block to be distinctly different? And when you do that, there is less stability, there is more chance of messing up the colors and having to rethink colors. It's more involved in terms of color planning, but the benefit of doing this choice, right, over the all solid, all the same, is that there is so much play in doing this idea. Same block, different colors, every single time, right? And again, one is not right and the other wrong. They are both right. It just depends on what you like to look at. Sometimes it's nice, particularly on the floor, having a rug um, that has a repeat pattern, almost like a textile. It's a little bit easier on the eye, whereas this kind of thing is meant to be wall art. It is wall art. Uh, this piece is called House of Dreams, and you can see how on some of, in some of the blocks, the house is really recede, almost like there's a haze or a mist in front of them, right? They just recede into the back a little bit. Uh, color choices. One of them is red with a very red background. Exciting color choices. You know, quilting, as you know, works differently than rug making. You get all of these blocks in your hand, and like a puzzle, you're able to lay them out on the table. Well, as rug makers, you could draw it out or print it out, color it in like a coloring book. Double chimneys like Croft Houses, Karen, I know, aren't they too, too cute? Um, you can lay it out in the same way because if you're trying to do something like this that's really tricky with some of the houses receding almost ghostly, you can still do that in a rug form. You just have to plan it out in a different way, either by coloring it in in advance or using your computer to help you do the color planning. This is a very busy one. This is a, a the same style house but with more of a little more of like a little cypressy shape, I think, because she's calling this one French Connection. So using a lot of blues and yellows, certainly red, her neutral, and her black and white, right? Those are the main colors, um, her signature. But doing many more and having very, this is more like a row quilt, right? If you're a quilter, you know that term, a row quilt. Um, and she is building it block by block, and she does say in the book she builds row by row. So a lot of fun, completely different process, certainly something to think about visiting if you haven't quilted yet, just a different process but we as rug makers can do this exact same thing our process is just different this one's called Freddie's house remodeled another giant one and you can see here that she moved away from what Karen called last night in class the Hollywood squares configuration I called it Brady Bunch but Hollywood squares is better because there were more squares which is just like a grid moving away from that tipping it's on it's on its side to make a window pane so we've got diagonals you could even, in theory, pull it. If you can imagine pulling the framework of it to make diamonds rather than di diagonal squares. Regardless, she has tipped this composition on its side and done a very similar one to her regular, her first house quilt. That's the wind blowing the vinyl siding, if you hear that. Um, but the configuration is completely different and it makes for a completely different um, composition and look altogether. And as we were saying last night, and as all quilters know, when you tip something on its side, you get two things. It, it's like blessing and curse. It depends on how you view it. You get a built-in border, right? Because you get these half squares all the way around. You get either a built-in border, or if you don't want it to be a built-in border, then you have a project of figuring out how to deal uh, with there not being um, straight sides, right? So it depends on how you approach it and what you like. But there, I like seeing the border like this. She's got it really busy like log cabined out on the edges where the reds are and she's really able to frame it well very simple technique this one's called the stars at night a really charming neighborhood feel uh, if we were going to sally put one house together each it makes me feel like this putting a little fence around it like our own community to make like a you know, I want one of everybody's quilts, right? Everybody's square to put a little community like this and fence it out. Wouldn't that be so cute? I love that idea. Let's evolve that too. I, I, I'm hot on that one for sure. 
But I like the idea of using for a border the white picket fence. It is like so eternally the American dream, isn't it? So sweet. Really, each one is very different. This one is called A Dress Unknown. Uh, very heavy star motif. You can see how she's really pushing to use different motifs and include them in that. She's got a whole series of house quilts and she's putting them in her house. So in her mind, these two things are locked together. They're running parallel. Sometimes we do this, right? We resolve problems. It, it feels like she's resolving the problem of buying a house that she bought for the yard and doesn't like the inside at all. And as she decorates, running parallel to that huge project, she's putting her house quilts in. And one thing is resolving the other and likewise, right? It's like this, like she said, symbiotic relationship. So it's like she's experimenting with different elements. She's stretching, she's reaching, but she's keeping her houses in there because it's like the ground under her feet, right? It's that sameness that she's going for. And this one is called Rachel's Quilt. Very, very busy, very effective. Lots of her black and white. She's used the same material, which helps a lot with seeing it because it's very busy, very pop art, bordering on op art, optical art, isn't it? There's all kinds of illusions here. You see, this one also has that straight chimney running right up the side, and that really is helping identify one block from the next because it is profoundly busy. Now, in some quilts that you see, you see people skipping every other block because of busyness, right? Because of um, a fear of it getting too busy and chaotic not for Freddie. She is not worried about that. She's putting a very small border in, but the border is still busy. She's creating symbols that you see the little sort of yellow triangle with the red rectangle under it. She's creating that as little um, sort of bookends, right? Little placeholders so your eye can stop and rest and it can find one image to the next image. To the next. But this is the most sort of optical art image of hers that I've seen. Very busy. But wait, there's more. I mean, this one also is quite busy. This one is called Freddy's World Africa. And she's done African style, uh, an African style um, tweak on it with like the outdoor thing, right? She's got a similar house, but she's put like different vegetation and trees and stuff. And then she's used African style fabrics, not the global fabrics that are truly African, like the waxed cottons, but African prints, right? To really tie the thing up smart and she's got this on a beautiful bright pink wall it's making me rethink my pink wall because I hated it so much and looking at Freddie's I think yeah maybe I maybe I do like a very pink wall um, so it brought me also to this book this is the other book I was looking at last night this is called Q is for quilt and this is a lot of birdhouse stuff. The patterns inside, very, very, uh, very inspiring book. She does a few things with the straight up house block again. And they were very different than Freddie's. Now the black and white is similar, right? More beige and white. But this piece is called the big house, right? And it's funny because it's got some black and white stripes like, I don't know if it's a prison reference or I don't think so, but I like how it's housed within a house. I thought, how clever, isn't that neat? Q for Quilt, and this is by Diana McClun and Laura Nouns. And this is another one that's in there that's called Topsy Turvy House. So this is what happens when you take your blocks and instead of putting them in some kind of window pane or Hollywood Squares composition, you put them in sideways and you get crazy time. Fun, right? Oh, Sally says, there is a good consistency in Freddie's pattern so the busy part works. Absolutely. And, and it almost becomes, I'm going to say it, almost becomes a neutral using those crazy black and white checkers and polka dots as long as she's sticking with the same one because your eye starts to uh, recognize it, accept it, and then search for other elements and aspects. So I think using too many crazy patterns would make it into a uh, Where's Waldo? But the way that she did it, you are absolutely right. It really works. There is some sameness uh, and some structure to the chaos of it. Crystal says, I watched an old video the other day and loved the pink wall. Oh, thanks, Crystal. I'm getting to love it. I'm just about to move uh, out of the space into a different space. And I don't know, Jay, I might have to pa paint another pink wall. <laughs> so this is the topsy-turvy house, really um, a different composition. And they've got sort of crazy quilt, 
versions topsy-turvy log cabins, right? They've tipped log cabins on the side too. Very unstable composition, but the amount of sameness in it saves it from being confusing. And then I found some other really nice compositions on the internet. This is just a plain, very sort of neon schoolhouse um, that is on a website called Accu Quilt. This is the Go Mod Schoolhouse on Accu, A-C-C-U, Quilt, one word. And I found this nicey, Friendship. This is the one I use for the thumbnail. This is an antique uh, schoolhouse quilt, right? So schoolhouse and house are the same because the old schoolhouse is a house, right? We don't really have the bell and everything till a little bit later in the settlement years. The original schoolhouses are houses. So this is Friendship, uh, that's the name of it, from the National Museum of American, let's see, what was it? American, uh, gosh, I can't see the end of it. I think, I wanna say design, but I'm not sure. I'll try to put it in the, um, into the description after we leave. I'm gonna have to go in a minute, but you know what talking about houses made me think of? While I was going through slideshows and looking for house quilts, in my head, because I'm crazy, I was thinking about songs that all had the word house in it. So I'm gonna give you a gangbusters, five minute, quick trivia, name that tune, see if you can add in the comments if you recognize these songs that are about home. Tell me with this one who the singer is or what the song is. I'm gonna read you the lyric. Another summer day has come and gone away in Paris and Rome, but I wanna go home. Do you know who that is or what the name of that song is? Here comes number two. Home is where my thoughts escaping. Home is where the music's playing. Home is where my love lies waiting silently for me. Do you know the song or the person who wrote that song? Lynn says, if you were to do another uh, pink wall, you could do a different shade of pink. Might be darker rose or dusty rose. It's going to be dusty rose. No, it's I, I thought this was Dusty Rose when I bought it. I was super wrong. It's like, it, it's like punch your face rose if there is such a color. Here comes the third one. This is a newer one. Father wears his Sunday best. Mother's tired, she needs a rest. The kids are playing up downstairs. Sister's sighing in her sleep. Brother's got a date to keep. He can't hang around. See, I'm trying not to do the melody of it because that would be a dead giveaway. See if you can figure out who that one is. Uh, here's another one. Come to me now and rest your head for just five minutes. Everything is done. Such a cozy room. The windows are illuminated by the evening sunshine through them. Fiery gems for you. Yep, you're getting some of them there. Not sounds of silence, Doreen, but you're very close. Don't forget to, oh, thank you. Oh man, let's see. I had some that were quite hard that I won't do because we're running out of time. Okay. This, I'll give you a clue. This is a Beatles song, but this is not one of their better known songs. So see if you can figure out what the title to this lyric is. You and I have memories longer than the road that stretches out ahead. And I'm going to skip the next line. You and me burning matches, lifting latches on our way back home. Do you know that one? We're on our way home. That's a really nice one. And... Let me give you one more. I know you're all going to get this one. All my memories gather round her, miner's lady, stranger to blue water, dark and dusty, painted on the sky, misty taste of moonshine, teardrop in my eye. <laughs> Amanda, you got the Our House ones. Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Absolutely. Yep. I don't think it's with Young then, although it might be. That was Our House. Michael Buble, Simon Garfunkel. You got it. You're getting them all. You're good, you're good. I'm gonna give you a super challenge, right? This is one, by, I'm gonna say it's by Stan Getz, if you know Stan Getz. It goes like this. Our veranda will command a view of meadows green, the sort of view that seems to want to be seen. And when the kids grow up and leave us, we'll sit and look at that same old view, just we two, Darby and Joan. Do you know this one? I don't want to go too far because I'll give it away. See if you know the title to that one. It's one of my favorite old, old songs. Yeah, I have some hard ones on there. I don't know what I was thinking, but you got most of them. So the first one was Michael Buble. You got that. The second one was, 
uh, Homeward Bound, right? Simon and Garfunkel. The third one was Madness, Our House. The fourth one was Crosby, Stills, and Nash, um, Our House Again. And the next one was um, The Beatles. I don't know if anybody got that one. That is, called, that is a song called The Two of Us. I think that was the last one that John and Paul sang together. Um, and the very last one was John Denver, of course. It was Country Roads. Take Me Home, I think. It's also called Take Me Home. Oh, thank you, uh, Doreen. Not this morning, I'll tell you. Um, I am so wrecked. I'm going to go pick those kids' butts up, and I'm going to go home, and I think I have to lay down for a little while. I have had it. Um, I'm still thinking about whether I'm going to run a show tomorrow because I am so behind with everything. But, you know, I think I will because I love our Friday nights together. I'll think about what I'll work on. It, it's a bummer to wake up at, like, three-something and, and just lay in bed for hours and hours because you lose that time, and then you need to rest later, and it's just awful. It's an awful use of time. Um, anyway. <laughs> oh, thanks. All right. Well, fun episode. I'll think of what, what we should do on, um, on Friday for cocktail night already tomorrow night. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm getting like all of the orders out right now. Now that that, that class is all set and it can run again on its own. Joss has tap tonight too. Oh my God. All right. Have a great night, everybody. I will see you tomorrow night for cocktail night. Take care. I will see you then. Thumbs up, like, subscribe. Patreon members, thank you so much for your support. All of the links are in the body of this description. I will see you tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for 